Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Do you have this one? There we are. The scripture says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of... Good, you got, you got it. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. When I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as, I was, as, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon, up upon their feet. Notice, an exceeding great army. I want to speak to you, that many preachers have preached on this passage of Scripture, but I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, can these bones live? Can these bones live? Father, I pray that you'd allow me to be a help to thy people. Lord, you know the needs of your people, and I'm asking you today, you would bless in a special way. May our lives be changed. May our lives be different because we've been in church, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In our text verse, the Lord carried Ezekiel into a valley of bones. He set them down in the midst of all these bones. Can you, can you imagine being in this little valley? Bones just laying everywhere. Not just any bones, but the scripture says they were very dry bones. If you know anything about bones, that means that there's been no life on those bones for a long time. Um, you get a, you get a, you get a fresh bone. It's still, it, it, it's still flexible to some, to some extent, but a dry bone is fragile. It breaks. It's there's, there's been no life on it, no moistness on that bone. And, and, and God came to Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, he says, can these bones live? God was looking at Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, he was literally coming to him and said, he said, Ezekiel, do you have a vision? Can you see life in these bones? Do you believe that he got saying, do you believe that I can do something with these bones right here? God saying this, he goes, what's it going to take for you to stop believing that I can't make these bones come to life? It was God coming to Ezekiel and saying, Ezekiel, it's time you have a vision for these bones. It's time that you believe that I'm an all-powerful God that can bring life to some dead bones and make life come again. It don't matter what those bones are, God can bring life to them again. Ezekiel allowed God to give him a vision for those bones. God's vision for the bones passed to Ezekiel which led to Ezekiel beginning to preach to the dead bones. God says, Ezekiel, preach. Can you imagine? 
I know there's a lot of preachers feel like they're preaching to dead bones on a Sunday morning, but, but I, I'm not preaching to dead bones because I saw the blank look on your face when I said turn to Exodus. So you're not the dead bones that I'm talking to this morning. But oftentimes, they, he said, preach, he says, to the dead bones. And I can imagine Ezekiel thinking to himself, good night, i got to preach to this dead crowd right here. And he just stood up and started preaching the word of God. Can you see him beginning to go, maybe begin to say in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I can see Ezekiel begin to preach uh, about, about the Lord to those bones and all of a sudden, he sees those bones. Can you, can you imagine? Let me tell you something. You talk about a revival service, that's going to start stirring the preacher because those bones that were all separated, those bones started coming back together as he's preaching. All of a sudden, the bones are coming back together. All of a sudden, there's flesh starting to come onto those bones, and all of a sudden, the arm bones started, uh, the, the arm bones started connecting to the shoulder bone, and a uh, shoulder bone connected to the chest bone, the chest bone connected to the hip bone, and the hip bone connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone connected to the shin bone, and the shin bone connected to the foot bone. All of a sudden, the bones started coming together. Then the flesh starts coming, wrapping around those bones. And then... God comes and says to him, he says, Ezekiel, he says, do you think they can really live? He says, I see the bones have come together. There's flesh on them, but there's no breath inside of them. He says, preach again. He began to preach to the wind. And as he preached to the wind, all of a sudden, the breath of God began to breathe back into those bones. Those bones, as Scripture says, came to life as he's preaching. And those bones, get this now, became a mighty army. Listen to me very carefully. You need to see that the dead bones in your life can become a mighty army. Some of you, you look at the dead bones of your family. You see your family in disarray. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you see that God can make your family come alive for God again? Let me ask you a question. Some of you parents who struggle with your children, they're the dead bones that you're looking at. Do you have a vision for God to do something for that wayward child? Or are you say, have you washed your hands and said, I'm done with them. I'm tired of them. I'm tired of all the, all the heartache and the stress they caused to me. Have you lost your vision for that child who's maybe gone wayward? Hey, can these bones live? I ask you a question. Sunday school teacher, can your Sunday school class thrive again? I ask you a question. Those who've gone away in life, can those bones live again? Some of you sit here this morning and your life has been a wreck. Sin has wrecked you. Oh, you're in church this morning, and I'm glad that you're in church. But you sit here in church, and you think, well, I'm just going to try to do the best I can because I really don't think God can do anything with me because I've gone so deep. I'm just going to at least just try to go to church and try to be good. Let me help you out. You may have gone into sin as a Christian, but let me tell you something. Thank God we serve a God who's a living God, who's a forgiving God, and he can take the old sinner who's been, who's Follow to the mire of the muck of sin, but God can take them out of that miry clay and set their feet on a rock and establish their going again. And may I tell you, you may think that it's too far. No, God can breathe on those bones, and God can use you again. You may have gone in sin, but God can still use you. I look at old Maranatha Baptist Church. Can these bones live? 
Can we see flesh and all the red and cover up the red? Help me out just a little bit. Brother Means and his wife wore red this morning. I said, y'all wearing the wrong color in this church. They say, well, we're doing it so we can blend in. I understand, you know, when you're backslidden, you're trying to blend in with the pew. I understand that. But they're in the second row, so they're okay. But you listen to me this morning. I'm talking to you this morning. Do you think that God can breathe life into Maranatha Baptist Church? And make it a thriving church in this area where one day this auditorium can't house the crowd that we have where God's got to do something even greater for us. Can these bones live this morning? Do you have a vision? You see, without a vision, you will die. God says where there is no vision, the people what? perish. When you have no vision for your life, let me tell you something, you're going to die. When you are, hey, hey, husband, when you have no vision for your family, your family's going to die. Hey, married couples, when you have no vision for your marriage, your marriage is going to die. Hey, young person, when you have no vision for your life, hey, your life is, is headed for death. I, listen to me. So you teenagers in here, you're sitting in church. Listen to me. If I ask you, what do you plan on doing with your life? What's your answer? I get tired of asking teenagers, what's your goal? Oh, Yeah, video games. Let me tell you something. Video games are not going to pay your bills. Somebody help me out just a little bit. So you teenagers need to get a vision for yourself, something greater than everybody around you, and realize God made you, and your life is special to God, and God allowed you to come to this church this morning to hear this sermon that maybe you could get a vision for yourself so that you could go out there and do something mighty for God. Hey, get a vision for yourself. Vision. Gives you passion. Vision produces a fire inside the heart. Vision gives compassion for the dead bones. Vision brings excitement. Vision gives purpose of living. When you have a vision, you have purpose. You have drive. You have something that keeps you going beyond what everybody else will ever go. I was talking to Brother Sandy Harjo this morning. He started the keto diet. God help him. He was telling me what he has to live, and he pulled out the thought, yeah, I got some snacks here. Well, good. I'm going home having a whole meal. Praise God on that one right there. But you know, that diet, because he has a vision of where he wants to get, some weight he wants to lose, it's given him a purpose, get this now, a purpose to say, I'm willing to do away with some things I really like because I desire this greater than this right here. And a vision makes you prioritize in life, listen to me, what is important and what isn't important. Some things that in life that we do are not bad, but it conflicts with our vision. Therefore, we got to lay that aside because this over here is more important. I wish some of you this morning would say this morning, listen, I want more of a vision for my Christian life than just to come to church and sit in a pew. I'm glad that you're here, but could you get a bigger vision for your life? Do you have a vision for your life? What do you plan on accomplishing this year? What's your goal to accomplish, listen to me, spiritually this year? We gave out the Bible reading schedules. If you don't have one, ask the ushers. I think we still have some, some of them left. I'd encourage you to say, I want to read my Bible every day. Get a vision for it. Get a vision for it because it gives you a purpose to wake up on time to read your Bible. Somebody say amen right there. 
get a vision for that. You got to have a vision. I want to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, going to be in church. Get a vision for that. Get a vision. Hey, some of you who've never led one person to Christ, why don't you get a vision to lead your first person to Christ in 2019? Say, you know what? I want to... I want to do it sometime this year. I want to start working on it. I'm going to start learning how to be a soul. I want to lead someone to Christ. I want to bring one of my converts to church and, and say, this is someone that I was able to lead to Jesus Christ. That ought to be a vision. Get a vision for yourself. You say, preacher, what will it take to make the bones live? Let me in the next few minutes, let me tell you what it takes to make the bones live. Number one, you have to see, the, you have to see beyond the bones. You have to see beyond the bones. Listen to me. What do you see in your life? Is it positive or negative? Are you half full or half empty? Come on now. Negativity kills every vision. You know, those who are negative don't see the good in this, what's happening in this church. They see the negative what's happening in this church. Those who see negative don't see the good that God's doing in their life. They see the negative that God's doing in their life. Those who are negative don't see the good that God's doing in their marriage. They see the negative that God's doing in their marriage. Listen to me. Those who see negative in life, they don't see the good that their children are growing up. They see the negative in those children. Listen to me. Okay, we got some teenagers here. I'm glad they're in church. I'm, glad, I'm happy that these teenagers are in church. Why? Because they, did, they don't have to be here, but they've come to church. They've come to church. Listen to me. Somewhere you've got to look beyond and say, okay, do I have a vision for getting out of my situation? Listen, you will never see beyond the bones of debt. Do you have a vision of one day being out of debt? Come on now. Debt probably affects 90-something percent of the crowd in here. And it controls you. And somewhere you need to get a vision for your finances to say, you know what? I'm tired of being a servant from paycheck to paycheck. I've got to do something more than where I'm at right now, because I, my, I, was, I was joking with my wife the other day. I said, and, and we, we, we were just joking with each other. If You know that old statement, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. Listen, you keep on doing the same thing over and over with your finances. Let me tell you something. You'll not dig yourself out of that financial hole. you got to have a vision for your finances and say, you know what? I'm tired of letting finance. I'm tired of this. I've got I've to live from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Listen to me. Some of you have some things in your finances you need to get rid of so you can free up your finances. That was popular. Hey, do you have a vi- do, do you see beyond the brokenness of your family? Mom and dad, listen to me. Stop always pointing out the negative in your children. You're killing them. You're killing their spirit. You're frustrating them because you never praise them. And even in your praise sometimes, even your praise at times is negative. Amen, preacher. Listen to me. There's a lot of parents who have driven their children away from them because all they, they nitpick their kids apart. Now, I'm not saying you justify them doing wrong, but I am saying this. It's time, Mom and Dad, you stop always pointing out the negative in your child, and maybe you might find out if you could praise them without having the negative tone in your praise. That maybe your child might say, huh, that's what they want me to do. Let's move on to that one. 
Wow. Hey, the vision for your marriage. Do you have a vision for your marriage? Are you so negative on your spouse? Well, you don't know who I'm married to. Well, I see who they're married to. Let me, let me, let me out. You're not God's gift to be a spouse. Come on now. And for you to always think it's your spouse's fault. Let me ask you a question. Why don't you stop blaming your spouse for everything? Look at yourself and say, I've got to get a vision so I can be the spouse I need to be. Do you have a, do you have a, a vision for your life? Potential. Do you see the potential? Listen, stop letting the dead bones of the past, get this now, to stop you from seeing God to do a work in your life. You say, but preacher, my past is this. Okay, that's the past. Let's go from this day forward. I can't change this back here, but I can affect this up here. And if I live back here, I am affecting that up there in a negative way. I've got to say, okay, that's done. I may not like it. It may be bad. But I want to start affecting this in a positive way by doing right and living for the Lord. Listen, get a vision for the bones. Second, you cannot let the greatness of the vision overwhelm you to quit. Listen, some of you are looking at where you've got to get, and you look at it like, Whoa. Listen, it's like a person who's trying to lose a lot of weight, and I'm talking three-digit weights. That can be overwhelming. You could sit there and say, it'll never happen, or you can take the first step. You can say, okay, okay, I, don't, I, I, don't, I know right now, I, I can't, I can't it's, it's big, it's huge, I see what God's trying to do, but I'm not going to let the vastness of this vision over me. Third, you have to trust that God can make the bones live. Trust God. Listen, it was faith that made Ezekiel preach to the dead bones. It was faith that made Noah to begin to build an ark. It was faith that caused Peter to step out of the boat on the water to walk to Jesus. It was faith that led the early church to turn a world upside down for Jesus Christ. They had the trust that God, God said, this will happen. You just have to do this. God says, Ezekiel, preach. And what did he do? He preached. He trusted God. It took faith. Which that leads me to this. God can make your bones live if you have that faith. For instance, God can allow us to reach this city if we have the faith that we can reach this city. I believe that with all my heart. God can make your family turn around if you have the faith that God can turn it around. One of the questions I ask married couples when they're struggling, I say, do you believe that there's hope for your marriage? And if the answer is no, then there is no hope. You've always, listen, don't ever lose hope in God's power. Listen, how do you think, how do you think that these who've been married for so many years in our church have stayed married? I'll tell you exactly how. They've worked through it. And listen to me, there was times that they said, okay, we don't know. But they had faith that God could do, that God could work some things around. I'm saying you've got to have that faith that God can work through whatever it is. Listen, your broken life, you can make the, broken, the bones of your broken life live again if you have faith that God can use you again. Oh, listen. He said, but preacher, I'm bad. Okay, let me ask you this. Are you better than a donkey? If God can use a donkey, God can use a believer who comes back to him. Let me just and let me just be very blunt with our church. If we ever get to the point in our church where we believe that somebody has forfeited the right for God to use him, then our church is in trouble. Who do we think we are? 
that we think that, oh, I'm so great and mighty that God can use me. Hey, you better beware because I'm telling you, you're on, a, you're, on, you're on very dangerous ground that God just may smack it out from underneath you. I'm thankful for some of those in our church who've come to me and said, Preach, I want to get everything right. I want to start going back. And listen, I don't, I don't need to know what you've done. You beat yourself up enough. I mean, I don't need to know that, but I'm telling you right now, I believe in you. I believe in you. My wife will tell you that I, I, there's, I just have this knack. I believe that people, that God can use people no matter what they've done. Listen, I'd always be, rather be on the side in believing that the fallen can be used again than to be on the side that criticizes the fallen and keeps them from getting up. people in our church right now that got saved they're trying to fight some vices and I and I see them trying and they're trying you say believe God can use them yes the bones can live statement number four you can't quit halfway into the vision you know it's interesting God put everything together but there was no flesh on the bones God looked at Ezekiel and said, Are they, Ezekiel said, well, they're, they're together, but there's no breath in them. You know what happens to a lot of people? We see a little bit of success towards where we're going, and we're satisfied with that. Don't stop until God's done. You know what? I'm excited about the crowd we have this morning. Good crowd. But I'm not stopping here. I hate to tell you that. Some of you think that this is all I'm wanting. No, 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 no. This is not even the beginning surface of where I want to go. Why? Because I believe there needs to be a church in Oklahoma City that, that, that stands for the old-time religion, that stands up and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's a soul-winning church that reaches people and gets them saved, gets them baptized, gets them back out and serves the Lord. I just believe that. Listen to me. Somewhere we as God's people have got to get a vision and say, let's not stop right here. We've had a little bit of success. Hey, let's go do what God can do through us. What does it take for the bones to live? I like this part. It takes preaching. What did God tell Ezekiel to do? Preach. You know what preaching does? Preaching stirs you. You make a decision every time you hear a sermon. You make a decision for good or bad. You make a decision. You either say, I can't stand what that guy's saying, or you say, boy, that's good. But you're making a decision. See, preaching brings you to some decision, one way or the other. And you're either going to decide, I'm going forward from here, or I'm going to rebel against what that preacher says because I don't like how he says it. I don't like how loud he is. I don't like how boisterous he is. You can, you can blame it on anything, but you're making a decision. You're always making a decision. You know what stirred my heart more than anything else throughout, the, throughout my lifetime? I'll sit in a church and hear a preacher preach a sermon. It's like, whoo! Man, it just starts to begin to crank it inside. The Holy Spirit takes that sermon, begins to crank inside. The flames begin to begin to burn inside. As I hear the preacher preach, I think, boy, boy, yeah, that's what I want. I want God to do that inside of me. May I tell you, that's why you need to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why? Let the preaching of the Word of God ignite the flames of your vision so God can do something through you. Which leads me to number six. And I love this one. You need the breath of God to make your bones live. This is interesting. I was studying for the sermon, and I got excited as I was studying for the sermon because this part right here just kind of stirred me up. Gave Brother Hyden right this week a a little peek into the sermon. You say, why? Because he needs it twice. That's why. Every time, listen very carefully, every time God breathes, 
something miraculous happens. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Listen. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. What was God doing? In Genesis 2, 1, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God built the first sand castle. It was in the form of a man's body. And God and man came alive. Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God hath made me and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. How did Job make it through his trials? God God breathed on him. How are you going to make it through your trials? God's going to have to Get the breath of God. Hey, the verse we just read in our text verse, it was the the breath of God that made the bones to live again. In Job 32, 8, but there is a spirit of man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. What is inspiration? It is an act of inhaling and exhaling. Follow me carefully. Oh, that word's found somewhere else. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You see what happened? That book happened. When God when God's word became life. John 20 and verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. And saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. What was it that caused the apostle Paul's, the, 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 the apostles to get the power of the Holy Ghost? It was God breathing on them. Talking to some of you this morning. You've had the vision, but you need to go a little bit further. You need God. (sighs) To breathe on you. You say, preacher, you're kind of you're getting a little spooky. Let me tell you something. Something real about the power of God that can help you with your problems. You've tried it under your own power. You've tried it with your own intellect. You've tried it with everything you know what to do. But may I tell you what you need to do is get alone with an almighty God and say, God, breathe on me. God, I need you to breathe onto me and give me that life inside of these bones. Tired of fighting it yourself. Tired of trying to make it work yourself. You need God. To breathe on you. 
You'll not find it. Listen to me. You'll not find it by running around with everyone else. You find it getting alone with God. Say, God, you've got to breathe on us. If the bones of Maranatha Baptist Church are going to make it, God's going to have to breathe on us. The bones of your marriage are going to make it. Hey! Why don't you get God to breathe on your marriage and on your family? On your finances, and I'm not trying to be weird or spooky, but I'm telling you, well, you got to get along with God and say, God, breathe on these bones. God, make this thing happen. God, I've got a vision. You've got to make it happen, God. God, breathe on my life. God, I don't want to go through the Christian walk and just be like everyone else. God! Breathe on these bones. When God chooses to breathe on you, you're going to find that that vision of that valley of bones in your life can become a mighty army for God to use. You hear this morning, you're not saved. The first thing God needs to breathe on, He needs to get you saved. And He did that by dying on the cross and shedding your blood. Don't be putting your Bibles up yet. He died on the cross and shed His blood for you so that you could go to heaven. Why don't you trust Christ this morning? Ask Christ to be your Savior. So you can go to heaven. Father, thank you for what.